Hi, all. Welcome to Iran 1400's Spotlighting an Author event. We are very happy to have you here today. Uh, today, we will be discussing Dr. Pamela Karimi's book, Alternative Iran, Contemporary Art and Critical Spatial Practice. As many of you may know, the goal of the Iran 1400 project is to encourage productive conversations about Iran by looking at the evolution of ideas and institutions within the country during the last century. We are certain that today's event will be a valuable contribution to that goal. Before we introduce our guest, our communications manager, Tabi Anvari, has a few words from the advisory board. Thank you, dear Sydney, Dr. Karimi. On behalf, I hope you can hear me. There yes. we go. Dr. Karimi, on behalf of the advisory board and the team at the Iran 1400 project, we thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. As Sydney mentioned, the Iran 1400 project's mission is to foster a greater understanding of Iran's history during the past century in order to promote an informed conversation about Iran's future. We're honored to have you with us today to share your research and insight on the Iranian experience. Welcome. Thank you, Tabby. All right, now it is my privilege to introduce our guest. Dr. Pamela Karimi is an architect and an architectural historian. She earned her PhD from the History, Theory, and Criticism of Art and Architecture program at MIT in 2009. Her primary field of specialization is art, architecture, and visual culture of the modern Middle East. She is currently Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, and she is also the author of Domesticity and Consumer Culture in Iran, which was published in 2013. Uh, the event, the format for the event today will be 30 minutes of listening to Dr. Karimi discuss her book. And then while we're listening to that, y'all can think of questions uh, because that will be followed by uh, 30 minutes for a Q&A session. And y'all are welcome to send those questions to media at iran1400.org or just ask them in the Zoom chat. Now we have a quick teaser and then we can begin our event. Dr. Karimi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sydney and Tabby, for this beautiful introduction. And thank you to all of our audiences for joining us this afternoon. Um, I really appreciate um, that. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm, I'm just going to start uh, by sharing my um, PowerPoint presentation. So hopefully, uh, some of the colorful images um, uh, that are the works of our hardworking and dedicated artists, designers, and curators in Iran uh, will animate this presentation and will give you a better sense of what's happening in um, the Iranian art scenes. Um, so um, the book, as uh, Sidney mentioned, is titled Alternative Iran, Contemporary Art and Critical Spatial Practice. The idea for uh, writing this book um, is partially rooted to my scholarship that has always had a tendency to look at what happens beyond uh, the public space and the public sphere that we are all familiar with. Uh, for example, what happens inside the privacy of people's homes? Um, how did certain kinds of um, cultural uh, features came to be in these private spaces that are not always visible to the rest of the world? 
but also in my personal uh, curiosity about this whole um, uh, you know a topic of uh, the underground uh, culture in Iran um, for a long time uh, I, I contemplated the idea of historicizing the concept of the underground is there such a thing as an underground physical or otherwise in Iran and if there is such a thing uh, then is it possible for us to historicize it in a in a in an accurate way? Uh, so as 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 Sydney mentioned, I'm also an architect by training. So I am very sensitive to the ways in which people organize their activities, cultural or otherwise, uh, throughout the city. Um, so this idea of the un underground captured my imagination um, from from the very early young age uh, to now, and not just because in the West the idea is um, uh, sensationalized and is very well known uh, among everybody outside Iran, but also because of my personal interest in organization of space. Um, books like Reading Lalira in uh, Tehran by Azar Nafisi or films like No One Knows About Persian Cats um, actually highlight uh, certain aspects of the underground culture in Iran. And these books are, of course, uh, very important. Uh, these movies are, of course, very important. We all appreciate the efforts of the makers of these uh, products. Uh, but um, at the same time, uh, because they have become part of the mainstream uh, kind of uh, 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 culture of understanding Iran in the West, um, uh, I think that they, they convey the idea that everything that um, has a challenging message or is against uh, uh, the ideals and ideas of the Islamic Republic actually takes place um, in hidden places. Um, uh, but that is not the case, as my research has proven. Um, the other question that is worth asking is whether or not the artists who involve in these alternative art spaces and alternative art practices are political or not. Because as we all know, in the West, there's a tendency to associate these activities with, with political activism. The point that I've made in my book is that the situation on the ground in Tehran and other cities in Iran is much more complicated than that. In other words, we cannot say for sure that this group of artists or that individual creative agent are actually political activists. However, as a movement, as, as something that has happened for a long, long time since the 1980s and after the Islamic Revolution, and also with roots to pre-Islamic revolution times, this movement as a whole uh, can be considered um, uh, a movement that has made um, a lot of changes in the society. It has been very impactful. And that's why the book ends by a quote from um, anthropologist Margaret Mead, who says, never doubt a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And one of the reasons why the book actually is 450 pages, as you can see, it's a, it's a kind of a thick book, is because I wanted to present these move, this movement through as many case studies as possible. This is a kind of movement, a kind of continuous effort on behalf of Iranian artists, theater experts, musicians, curators, and architects that has been going on for a long time. And it cannot be reduced to the example of the work of one artist or one creative agent. So that's why this book covers uh, a lot of information and a lot of um, case studies. Another reason why I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, think about these um, artistic practices as activist or political practices is that I engaged with um, in-depth interviews with a lot of artists and artist collectives um, uh, in Iran. And, uh, you know, many of them insisted that they did not mean to be political, even if the art project happened at the height of critical moments in Iran, like the Green Movement, they insisted that this was not a political 
gesture. This was not a political activist project. For example, this uh, collective of women, um, uh, uh, Tehran Carnival, uh, they told me uh, that they wanted to do the kind of ephemeral arts that they make in different parts of the city in Iran uh, because they just wanted to feel better. So the exact Persian term would be we just wanted to feel better. And then as a historian of art and architecture and, and urban issues, it was my responsibility to theorize uh, what it means to make art, to spend a lot of money and energy without making money out of selling this art in the uh, conventional art markets uh, to just feel better about yourself and about who you are in the society. So uh, the theory actually that supports and bolsters um, uh, a lot of activities in this book actually comes uh, straight uh, from uh, uh, the interviews and uh, the kind of engagements that I had with Persian literature. So um, the book is organized into uh, four chapters uh, uh, with an introduction and an epilogue. Um, so the chapters are organized somewhat chronologically, but most importantly, thematically. So they're organized around four concepts that, to my mind, actually define uh, what this uh, so-called uh, uh, underground culture is and how it materializes itself. Um, so these are um, actually uh, spatial techniques, if you if you will. Um, chapter one focuses on issues of invisibility, like what does it mean to have um, a presentation or an exhibition uh, in the basement of some building or or in some dilapidated structure or in some far away places. Chapter two um, talks about escapism. Uh, um, actually, uh, the word to escape. Uh, uh, you know, actually, as I as I as I highlight in the introduction to the chapter, actually comes from Michel de Certeau's uh, theory of escapism without leaving, um, which is rooted in this idea of how do you detach yourself from the system without negating it outwardly. Um, uh, so that's chapter two that discusses the activities that take place. Uh, off center, like away from the capital Tehran by Tehrani artists. And also, I must say, emphasize that this book is mostly about important artists that are based in Tehran. Unfortunately, uh, the scope of the book did not allow me to, um, uh, to highlight the work of um, uh, artists uh, who live in um, smaller cities um, outside Tehran, but hopefully in the future, uh, we can highlight those efforts as well, either myself or other scholars and art historians. Chapter three, ephemerality, um, actually um, focuses on the notion of time, how artists actually display art that seems controversial, uh, highly critical and challenging to the system uh, in public and open and urban spaces, but that by virtue of being ephemeral, uh, meaning very temporary, um, they can actually afford to survive and continue their survival um, over time. And finally, chapter four um, uh, is termed improvisation. Um, it focuses on this concept of improvisation that, of course, comes from jazz music, um, and also in Iranian art, um, uh, it's often highlighted in theater as uh, uh, but uh, the way I theorize improvisation um, is, is much more open-ended than that. In other words, um, I associate some curatorial activities and some negotiations that the artists and curators um, have to get involved with when it comes to gaining permission from Vezarate uh, Irshad or uh, the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance. And by the way, Vezarate Irshad is the single most important thing that I have highlighted in this book. And the ways in which um, artists actually deal with permissions um, and the processes that they're involved in, whether they get permission from Vezarate Irshad or not, is the keynote of many of the case studies that I have highlighted in this book.
why is it book called um, uh, alternative? Alternative to what exactly? Uh, you know, here in the West, uh, we are usually familiar with uh, the work of um, diasporic Iranian artists uh, like Shirin Nishat. These are all my favorite artists and their works are obviously uh, celebrated for good reason. They focus on very important topics, but the difference between Iranian American or Iranian French, Iranian European, Iranian Australian artists uh, um, between them and artists who work in Iran is that they do not have to deal with issues that are at stake in Iran. They do not have to deal with, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance or other governmental uh, or official entities such as the Shahdari, municipality, the Amakan, uh, or other entities, Shorai Shah, and, and so on and so forth, that the artists have to deal with in order to gain permission to present their arts. It is also alternative to official institutions. Um, so official institutions like the Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art, um, although I have to say that Tehran Museum of Contemporary Art, even though it's one of the most important uh, um, venues for presenting contemporary art, it's a little bit more relaxed than, uh, than more hardcore and, and pro-government institutions. And there are plenty of them throughout um, the city of Tehran and in other cities. So, uh, alternative to that would be presentations that take place inside places that are not uh, official, um, inside places that are not theater stages, inside places that are not official museums. Like, for example, this example of um, a, a, a wonderful political presentation uh, based on Shakespeare's plays uh, that takes place in the space of a taxi um, done by um, Azadeh Ganje, who is a, pro a professor of theater um, uh, in Tehran, but also um, uh, someone who has directed many of these experimental uh, theater works. Alternative would be presentations in dilapidated buildings. This is actually a movement that starts in the 1990s. It is known in Tehran as Kolangi, Kolangi movement, because when homes in Tehran were ready to be demolished to be replaced by high rises in the 1990s, uh, uh, with the help of uh, neoliberalization of economy uh, during the time of President Rafsanjani, artists actually occupy these spaces in order to present their works. These are all top-notch uh, Tehrani artists. Um, at the time, at the time, uh, they also had the opportunity to present in uh, uh, prominent galleries like the Golestan Gallery, but instead they decided to bring their artworks into these um, dilapidated spaces, into these Kolangi homes. And the book actually addresses um, um, a lot of these projects. After a while, um, these projects actually become more site specific. So as opposed to site oriented and responding to the dilapidated building, they try to also capture the meaning of these spaces in art history. We call these artworks site specific artworks. In 2006, uh, in a presentation in the older uh, headquarters of the Etelaat newspaper, which is a very major governmental newspaper, uh, Faride Shah Savarani did a vast, gigantic exhibition of newspapers. And this was um, at the height of uh, President Ahmadinejad's criticism of of journalists. So you can see the site specificity of this project is of significant significance here. Also, this book, as I said, has a tendency to historicize some of these activities. For example, I went as far as back as uh, the team houses or Hanahoy Timi of the leftist groups in Iran, the communist groups. These houses were covert areas where a lot of leftist groups actually uh, did their activities, political activities, they had their discussions, their reading groups, but they also produced a lot of uh, publicity materials uh, for their different um, uh, different groups, uh, whether it was Today or other uh, segments of the, um, uh, of the um, uh, communist uh, 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 you know, movement, um, they actually use these homes. Um, artist Parham Qalamdar actually uses 
In 2012, one of these homes, one of these Timmy homes, these covert homes, as his um, as his art space, as his canvas is, if you will, and he presents in one of these homes. So the work of this particular artist actually allowed me in the book to go back and historicize some of these practices and how and what they mean to Iranians uh, going back to the time of the covert activities of the left under the Shah. So now the term critical spatial practice that is used also in the title of the book, um, critical spatial practice is actually a theoretical concept um, that has its roots in um, a lot of theories, uh, leftist uh, theories um, uh, from the 1960s and 70s, uh, especially in France. Uh, so uh, some of the protagonists behind these theories are Michel de Certeau, um, uh, Henri Lefebvre, um, even Michel Foucault, um, if you will. And ironically, these theorists, these French authors are extremely popular in Iran. Their works have been translated. I actually had uh, uh, long discussions with translators of these books, the books that have been published by these French authors. Uh, but I also noticed how many times these ideas and these concepts um, are mentioned by artists. Um, critical spatial practice was coined as a term that has its roots in French intellectual uh, leftist uh, theory uh, by Jane Rendell, uh, a British um, architect and architectural historian who associated it uh, with certain artistic practices that take place in alternative spaces. But again, it was highlighted in the scholarship during the Occupy movement in 2008 to 2010, when um, a lot of writers and um, uh, and, and uh, political activists actually used the term in order to describe the activities of cultural workers during that time period. Um, so uh, let's talk about uh, space and why is it important. Um, in Iran, you cannot uh, paint or, or present work that is about, uh, you know, human sexuality or, 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 or naked bodies or these are these are very sensitive topics, right? They can be at times sensitive topics in uh, the American context too, but Iran, uh, strictly speaking, uh, these are completely forbidden. Um, so uh, the term that Iranians use in order to discuss this kind of art that is not displayable at all uh, are things like, um, uh, you know, Honare uh, Keshoi or Honare Zir Tahti, under the bed art or, or closeted art, um, uh, somewhat similar to the Soviet uh, culture of um, um, writing uh, for the desk drawer, something like that. Uh, so if you cannot present these, um, these kind of uh, bold uh, uh, themes in public, uh, then what do you do? Uh, here we have the beautiful version by uh, artist uh, Puya Ariampur, for whom I have a lot of respect. He's a very, very good artist. And uh, this is a work that is um, often associated uh, with the work of uh, um, Monita Farman Farmoyan, Shahrudia Farman Farmoyan, who uses a lot of these mirror works in her art to celebrate Iranian traditional architecture that abundantly used, especially in um, in Imamzadehs uh, or or places uh, that commemorated the saints in Iran uh, from the late Safavid period onward, and specifically during the Qajar period, these kinds of mirror work interiors uh, became extremely popular. Uh, now, these broken mirrors um, do not reflect your images um, very uh, vividly. So when you perform prayer in these spaces, you don't see your own image. And that's something that is forbidden in Islam. And even like Ayatollah Khomeini's Tozi al Masail uh, has talked about that. But as long as the image, the reflection is fragmented, it's fine. So Puya Arya Mehr actually uses this very concept, which is deeply rooted in traditional artistic practices of Iran as penhan kari modavim, constant concealing. So as you can see, it's part of the culture itself, 
but then it comes and it uh, uh, manifests itself in this work that is the representation of a sexual part of a woman's body and it's cytospecific specific because it's placed in a um, uh, in a mirror work hall within the Golestan Palace in Tehran from 2015. At first, when this work was presented, nobody noticed what the problem was, but then somebody highlighted the problem, so they decided to put a shroud on top of it, and then the work became more exciting because people would come in and they pulled the shroud and they wanted to look at what it is, um, and so uh, they keep adding layers and layers to it. So they put, for example, this divider in front of it, and the artist was actually very happy about this development because uh, he believes that art actually when it becomes part of the society when it becomes interactive then it gains more meaning then it becomes more exciting and interesting so he said i couldn't care less about this kind of method of constant concealment because that was in the first place uh, the most important message of the work so um, alternative art spaces in Iran, and especially alternative galleries and, and art exhibition spaces, uh, what can I say about that to you? Uh, you know, alternative art scenes uh, became highlighted particularly in the 1960s and 70s with the rise of the civil rights movement, the feminist movement. This is the Air Gallery in New York, a feminist art space. Um, and these are very, very visible. For example, they use the storefront of, of different businesses in order to um, showcase their artistic practices. And why do they want to be visible? Because visibility is important for these alternative voices in the West. They want to be heard. What happens in Iran, to my mind, is closer to what happened in the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, you even have an artistic genre, which is called, uh, which is called the apt art or the apartment art, where artists like uh, Ilya Kabakov actually presented their art inside their apartments and, and presented them to trusted audiences and the circle of artists um, that they could trust. Um, um, in order to place Iranian art in the art historical movement of the world, and particularly to see its connection to what was happening in the East, um, I actually um, interviewed some uh, artists in Moscow who were very active during the 1980s, uh, presenting their works in alternative spaces, dilapidated spaces, and often underground spaces. I talked to them about how they interacted with the KGB, and I tried to find the similarities and differences between what happens in Iran and what happened in these countries. Now, considering the word underground, so underground can be defined in so many different ways in Iran. There's not just one way. And a lot of the time, underground is actually a gray zone. It's not a complete covert space. For example, in the 1980s, the Armenian neighborhood in Tehran became an underground uh, for a lot of musicians who could not have the opportunity uh, to present their uh, unconventional music, for example, guitar playing or, uh, or, or uh, I'm sorry, rock music uh, in, 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 um, in official venues. Um, uh, churches even became places that accommodated artistic exhibitions and also uh, uh, musical performances. Uh, but it's not just the Armenian community that helped and accommodated these kinds of alternative practices. Um, it's also, as I highlight in the book, other minority religious groups that accommodate these kinds of activities. Often galleries in Iran um, are placed uh, inside uh, residential areas, uh, uh, most possibly the basement of some house. Um, are they illegal? Uh, not at all. Perhaps in their uh, first earlier years, uh, they were just 
private spaces that were open to trusted audiences. But then over time, a lot of these actually gained permission from the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance. And the stories of all of these are highlighted in my book. And I think it's important for us to pay attention to these stories because these stories will allow us to understand that there's nothing black and white in Iran. There are a lot of gray zones and it's there is no such thing as you know artists uh, as one entity and the government as another. There are a lot of gray zones, gray areas and places and areas and times when artists um, and the state actually collaborate with each other or they play a cat and mouse game. A, a collective underground bomb shelter um, in um, uh, during the Iran-Iraq war actually becomes an art space uh, for uh, the amazing curator Esana Rasulov, who's the cousin of Mohammad Rasulov, the filmmaker. Um, and so you wonder what is going on here? Why is there a tendency to go underground in Iran, even if you have permission from the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance? Why do you perform uh, inside uh, uh, an underground thermal bath uh, from uh, previous times? Uh, why do you prefer to present your art inside an electric room that is tucked away uh, in um, in um, in an official uh, business um, um, structure, uh, why do you have a tendency uh, to bring art down to the basements and deep into the ground? We even have uh, galleries in Tehran that are named after these underground spaces. For example, Abambar Gallery, uh, which is a water cistern. Um, why do we have a gallery that is built inside the Olympic size pool uh, of, of Fereyduna Av, who's one of the most important artists and curators in Tehran? What is going on here? Uh, who is the architect who would build this project? And what does it mean when he does his drawings in this way? I engaged uh, in a lengthy conversation with the architect of this project, uh, Reza Danishmir, who collaborated with his wife, Catherine uh, Spridanov, and both of them are Iranian, by the way, um, uh, and they, they have formed uh, the architectural firm Fluid Motion Architects, who have a lot of interesting ideas about how this gallery had to be made in this way and why they designed it in a way they did, that they designed it. These kinds of practices in theater actually um, are more official. Um, they are more solidified. Uh, we have theater in Iran that is called Teatre Apartemani, apartment theater or house theater. Um, so these are rooted in the teachings of Jerzy Grotowski and Peter Brook, who came to Iran during the Shiraz Festival of the Arts and they engaged in presenting their works um, in uh, all the structures in Shiraz, partly because in Shiraz you didn't have enough uh, uh, traditional or classical theater stages, so they had to, they were by, by by nature, they were obliged to present their works in these places, but they were also experimental theater uh, directors, um, so they took advantage of that. There's a book by Masoud Najafi Ardabili, it's called Grotowski in Iran, and I had the honor of engaging in a long discussion with Masoud about how Grotowski actually influenced uh, um, the theater of um, Iran and how these practices continued to be useful under the Islamic Republic. It seems like in theater, Bratowski was a perfect thing that happened to Iranian theater because he was coming from a communist regime, but he was anti-communism, but at the same time, anti-West. So he was somewhere in between. He was not, uh, you know, exactly uh, fitting into uh, uh, one category um, or two. Um, and I think in some ways uh, he, he, he 
he fits perfectly in the Nashari Nagarbi ideology of the Islamic Republic. So these spaces that are spaces in between uh, find their uh, place within Iranian theater. And even to this day, we have practices like the Qariz theater group um, spearheaded by the young uh, theater director Hossein Tawazonizadeh, who are composed of these theatrical performances with very limited audiences at a time, maybe five or six, who actually, like a, like a movie set, actually walk with these performers um, around these dilapidated buildings in central Tehran. Now, let's take a look at the concept of escaping without leaving, uh, which was initiated by uh, Michel de Certeau. Uh, why do Iranian artists actually go and perform in, um, in a cage outside Tehran? Uh, what is behind this? How can we historicize these activities? I looked a lot at the underground activities of the left before the Islamic Revolution and what the mountain meant for these people uh, to have activities that are not necessarily embraced by the state and by the police. Uh, so I historicized a lot of these practices that take place by Tehrani artists in faraway places, like in the middle of a desert, in, a, in the forests of the north, and so on and so forth. And I kind of uh, placed it within the art historical movement that was also very much in vogue in Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union. I looked and I compared and contrast their works with the works of these kinds of artists in the Soviet Union who went to faraway places outside city centers. Ephemeral practices shapes uh, uh, the, the, the central argument of uh, the third chapter of the book that talks about art that happens quickly in open spaces, but before the police comes to collect it uh, or to arrest the artist, it's gone. Uh, and I historicized that, going back to the time of the revolution when artists like Ghulam Hussein and Ami actually created this gigantic uh, sculpture in the middle of the road, uh, in the middle of the traffic. It's called Gereh Nat. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, I don't want to get into the details of it. You can tell from the name of the artwork that it is actually uh, something that alludes uh, indirectly to the revolutionary movement at the time. We have performances like this, Women in Red, that took place in Tehran in 2011. In 2006, Humar Murtazavi created these quick projects that like, you know, these vendors that um, actually, it have, it's very common in Iran, they, they stand by the side of the road and they sell like fruits and things like that. Uh, but instead, uh, he becomes a vendor for words and for concepts and ideas uh, that uh, to his uh, uh, mind uh, are rare in Iran. And in some ways, again, uh, these uh, art practices speak to what happened in the former Eastern Bloc. Milan Kijnak is a very good example. This is not to say that Iranian artists are copying anything from these artists of the past. In fact, these artists from the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc are not very known, especially among visual artists in theater more so, but not in the visual arts. Uh, but I found it amusing that the same kind of restrictions uh, that is imposed by the government resulted in similar kind of responses from the artists. And finally, chapter four talks about critical curation and improvisation. Uh, in this chapter, I talk a lot about the ways in which artists actually appropriate some of the things that are part of the Islamic culture of Iran and um, also uh, um, elevated by the Islamic Republic, like the Tazia performances or the processions during Tasuha and Arshura. So choreography becomes a method to shuffle your art viewers around gallery spaces and to uh, direct their attention to certain activities that are otherwise not so uh, visible. Uh, the changing of the spaces of art galleries, this is by artist uh, Mohammad Parvizi, who completely revamps the interior of Shirin Gallery in order to have uh, a different message for his audiences. 
uh, or this other artist uh, who holds his uh, own body around the floor of the gallery, or this other artist, Katayun um, uh, Karami, uh, who actually uh, places these uh, sticky patches on the floors of Azad Gallery in Tehran in order to challenge his uh, her audiences and this is actually uh, an artwork um, uh, that is directly uh, um, uh, connected to some of the political events that were taking place in 2008 and 2009. And finally, we have very, very talented curators like Esana Rasulov who believe in certain concepts like hardware, ex hardware expansion across overground and underground spaces. What he does is that he takes uh, unconventional spaces like uh, the front of old homes or rooftops and he curates projects in these spaces. And then finally, there are artists and architects who collect the remains of alternative spaces uh, that have been shut down by the government or have disappeared. Uh, they want to make sure that these exist in the art historical narrative of Iran. The book, uh, and this is the final thing that I want to add, Sydney, before I turn the platform to you. The book also talks about the strategies that are appropriated the other way around by the government. For example, the underground, the whole concept of the underground has been appropriated by the government itself in order to have more control over the population of Iran. I come up with certain terminologies, uh, for example, aggressive mimicry or um, or um, uh, or um, uh, <laughs> it's funny that one forgets uh, the things that you spend so much time thinking about. Uh, but predatory aestheticization is the term that I was thinking about. So these are only two examples of the ways in which I try to theorize how these techniques of uh, spatial um, uh, navigation uh, are appropriated by the government in order to have more control on the society. And on this note, uh, I'd like to stop sharing my PowerPoint presentation and turn the platform to Sydney. Thank you. Thank you so much for that fascinating presentation, Dr. Karimi. Uh, I'm very excited to get into the Q&A section. Uh, I'll remind the audience, y'all can ask your questions either through the Zoom Q&A or you can send them in to media at iran1400.org. Uh, please go ahead and start sending those in. Uh, while I wait for some of those to trickle in, I have just a few announcements about what the project has been up to. Uh, we now have published two podcasts on Iran-China relations. Uh, this is an interview that I did with Dr. William Figueroa, who is an Iran-China scholar. And the first episode is called Iran-China Relations, the Imagined Community of Asian Constitutional States. And it talks about the Iranian constitutional revolution and and the influence that that had on in China. And the second episode is more about current events. It's called Iran-China Relations, Geopolitics and Diplomacy. And it talks about just that. Uh, you can find the podcast on all the uh, podcast streaming platforms, uh, the Iran 1400 podcast. Also, we did uh, an AIS session and we focused on Iran's new century, the reckoning of Iran's national identity. Keep an eye out. We also will have a podcast about that session and uh, those who participated in it. All right. And once again, please do send those questions into the Q&A. And without further ado, I will start with the first question. And you, you mentioned this just a bit, but I have this, I have the book here with me as well. And as y'all can see, it is very thick. Could you add any more about why uh, the book is so thick and how you were able to just get such a massive amount of information? Uh, you're, you're muted. Well, thank you so much, Sydney, for that question. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I really wanted to highlight this, this um, kind of uh, um, alternative 
art scenes of Tehran as, as a movement. And in order to be able to prove that, I needed to uh, add as many examples as possible and as to be as diverse as possible to show uh, so many different ways that Iranians uh, quote unquote fight the system or improvise in order to survive and in order to be able to uh, create uh, um, uh, you know their art projects. Um, so one of one of them is that the other one is that the more I delved into the topic, the more uh, I found out. Uh, that um, I needed to gather more information from different um, different uh, uh, different categories of um, of the field of humanities, and because I'm an architect, it was a little bit uh, easier for me to do that. I talked to uh, urban planners. I looked at multiple issues of the bulletin of the Shahdari or the municipality of Tehran, the ways in which uh, rules and regulations for the city and for the buildings of, and for a spatial organization of the city has influenced um, these artistic practices was very important to me. And so I brought in the language from these disciplines into my book. Uh, likewise, uh, you know, um, a lot of uh, reviews of these art projects uh, that were published in Iran also allowed me to have uh, the multiplicity of views. Um, so it's not just the one sided interpretation of each project. I try to bring in different voices uh, as well as my own reading of the project uh, into this book, and that's why it, it became a lengthy project. Fantastic, thank you. That's incredibly interesting. Our next question is, uh, could you explain more the differences between public and private spaces? Because when I think about it, of course, I, I think about the literal definition and one is in an alternative underground scene, the other is in a museum. But uh, how, how about artists making their livelihood? I would imagine that this has an impact on that as well. Absolutely. Well, you know, we here in, you know, North America in particular, we have a tendency to uh, think about the Islamic Republic as this entity that has been consistent with its message and it has always been against uh, the people of Iran. Uh, but the story is actually much more complicated than that. Um, the situation in Iran changes depending on who's in power, not just in the president's office, but also those who are in charge of the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, the people who work for the ministry. Also, the people who work for the municipality, these are the agents that issue permission, that give freedom to artists to do one thing or the other. Um, also, Iran has gone through several tumultuous times since the Islamic Revolution. Some of them are more critical than others. For example, during the Green Movement in 2000. Nine, uh, things became for a long time period, things became much more restrictive for artists, but then they kind of opened up. So the situation on the ground is is very complicated, depending on who's in power, who's in charge and so on, and, and what's going on politically in the country. So the level of strictness actually fluctuates. Sometimes artists experience more freedom. Uh, and sometimes uh, they are more restricted. In terms of the livelihood of the artists, um, it's actually a very good question. Sometimes it seems like the artist has very, very limited uh, group of audiences, and perhaps uh, people from his own uh, friend circles. A and they do this just to elevate their own mood they don't do this to uh, to gain the attention of the media at large, and especially these kinds of activities um, uh, are more um, noticeable before social media became so popular in Iran. Uh, of course, after social media became so popular, there's more uh, coverage uh, or more images of these that come out of Iran. But again, they're very scattered and it's kind of hard to make sense of what is underground, what is not. 
what is restricted, what is not, what, what has permission from the Ministry of Culture and what doesn't have permission. And so this book tries to elaborate on the very nuances of these regimes of control. Thank you. That that goes right into a question we have from the audience from uh, Alexandra, Bra Alexandra Braverman, who asked, what avenues exist for alternative Iranian artists to disseminate their work? I know that you mentioned social media. Uh, I would imagine that that's nowadays incredibly useful. Absolutely. Alexander, thank you very much for that question because usually the kind of art that we know from Iran is a kind of art that goes and enters the, uh, the prestigious auctions in Dubai or galleries in the West and so on and so forth. So it's, um, it's permanent art. It's an object. It's a piece of pottery. It's, it's an artwork on a canvas. It's not the kind of art that I'm speaking in this book, most of which is curation, most of which is ephemeral, most of which is performance. Therefore, it happens in a certain space at a certain time, uh, but it's not meant to be there forever, to be displayed on a pedestal in a museum. So this kind of art actually has a huge impact on the society, it transforms the culture, it's a culture making machine. And that's why I have so much respect for artists who do this kind of work. A lot of them, of course, don't make a lot of money out of these ephemeral art projects. And on the side, sometimes they have to also make tangible art and to present it in prestigious galleries to make a little bit money, uh, a little bit of money on the side. But usually um, the avenues were very limited before social media. After social media, they've become more opened up. But in terms of the market, and I talk also about uh, the economic aspects of these projects too in the book, um, I have to say that as one of the artists, uh, Amira Mobet told me, this is kare farhangi, this is cultural work. You do it almost like for the sake of for the sake of safeguarding culture in a society like Iran, not for the sake of making money. Great, thank you. Our next question is from Fariba Zarinebov. Uh, what a fascinating book and project. I did not witness this much art when I was growing up in pre-revolutionary Iran. Uh, how do you explain this creativity and diversity? And how hard was it to do this research? Thank you, Fariba, first for being here. Uh, I have so much respect for your own work as well. Um, yes, Fariba, I have to say that compared to the pre-revolutionary situation, we have so many different diverse voices in the post-revolutionary period. And they're not just the top-notch artists that are supported by the Pahlavi regime and are funded and have their education mostly in Western institutions and so on and so forth. The age group varies. Some of them are young students, college students. Some of them are more experienced, uh, the people that I have featured in this book. Um, and yes, the art scene is much more dynamic than the pre-revolutionary period. However, I have tried my best to uh, draw the connections whenever possible and whenever needed. For example, one of the things that artists do in Iran is the concept of parsezani darshah, or you know, wandering around the city to interact with different spaces of the city, and that itself can um, encourage them to come up with an idea for their art project. This is exactly something that is rooted in the activities of the artists of the Saqqa Khane movement. So in terms of the difficulty of the project, uh, Fariba, I have to say that it was not an easy project. Uh, although Iranian artists are extremely generous, they went out of their way, some of them, to even send me videos of people interacting with their art projects, things that you don't see on their official website or on social media. These were private with password protected, password protected private videos that they sent to me and shared with me. They spend a lot of hours talking to me. And I have to say the last two years of the project, which was during COVID, 
um, actually was a little bit helpful. And I, it makes me sad to say that because I know COVID was harsh for a lot of people. Actually, a couple of artists uh, with whom I interviewed uh, died of COVID and I'm very sad about that. But because of COVID, everybody was locked in their homes and people seem to have a little bit more time to spend with me and to answer my questions and to talk to me. Um, so um, that helped a little bit more. Uh, but also there was a difficulty of some people freaking out about what I was doing. They thought that I was trying to politicize them because you know these people work and function in Iran. They cannot be presented as a political artist. And I had to assure them that this was not a political project, that this project is, uh, is all about you know, showing the reality of what happens on the ground in Iran. Thank you. All right. Again, y'all in the audience can ask questions through the chat or the Q&A section of Zoom. Our next question comes from Maryam Ala Amjadi. Thank you very much for this talk. My question is rather simple regarding the beautiful virgin installation. Once they found out what it was, why wasn't it just removed? Wouldn't it have been easier to remove it from the public's view rather than cover it and veil it? Uh, thank you, Mariam, for that question. Actually, they couldn't because it's an extremely heavy art piece. Uh, they tried to do it, uh, but actually uh, they had to they had to schedule for um, different accommodations to move it out of the exhibition. Um, so it took some days before they could actually remove it. And during those days, of course, uh, this was the solution that they came up with. That's fascinating. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Sheda Dayani. Thank you for your well-researched work and fantastic presentation. Did you see any overlap between the theater performance artists and the visual artists in the groups that you studied? Uh, Sheda, that's a very very good question. Um, in terms of the connection between these, uh, these different groups, uh, Unfortunately, there's not so much communication and dialogues going on between people who do theater and people who do visual arts. And I was surprised to see that because actually visual artists can learn a lot from theater people. But you know, theater has always been a form of art that is open to the public, whereas art historically and especially in Iran has always been intended for certain groups within the society like you know the gallery goers the people who have college degrees and the people who can understand abstraction and kind of appreciate it whereas theater is more uh, open right theater tells you a story the theater entertains you so even if you don't have an artistic background you may go to watch a play just to be entertained, right? So I think the root of it is because of the different mediums of art and the different audiences that they engage with. But of course, a lot of the experimental theater that I discuss in this book are purely artistic. They have their own audiences. There are a few cases where theater people collaborate with curators in visual art galleries and I have tried to highlight those cases as much as I can, but there's much more work needed to be done both on behalf of theater uh, artists and visual artists inside Iran and both uh, as part of our responsibility here as historians to, to write about these things. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Karimi. The next question is a follow-up question from Fariba Zarinabov. Are, were there any projects related to COVID? Uh, Fariba, when it came to COVID, um, one of the things that I've highlighted in this book uh, is the emergence of, um, uh, you know, more discussions and debates and panels um, on social media, especially Clubhouse. Uh, during the last months of writing this book, I myself participated in a lot of these discussions on Clubhouse with different artists and artistic groups in Iran. 
And I think, yes, COVID played a very important role in terms of bringing a lot of these issues uh, to the fore uh, via social media platforms. Instagram Live was a tool that Iranian artists perfected during COVID. Like, I can't tell you how professional some of these presentations were. And I was part of many of them. So in other words, even though we are so far apart, I became part of the whole discussion and the activities that were taking place at the time. And I think that this was the contribution of the time, the lockdown time. Uh, but in terms of engaging with uh, the disease itself, uh, I don't think that that's something that I've highlighted in the book or thought about. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, is from Laudan Nushin. What are the class issues at work here? Did you talk to any artists from less affluent or more overtly religious backgrounds? Uh, thank you so much, Laudan, for, <laughs> for always being a great support. And I have to say Laudan's own work on underground music scenes in Iran uh, has influenced uh, my scholarship a lot. So I'm indebted to her. Um, Laudan, in terms of the class, um, issue that's a that's a very good question uh, you know there are different artists that i discuss in this book uh, graffiti artists uh, of course you know belong to a different clan sometimes they don't even have an art education but they're extremely active so i don't want to say that they are uh, they belong to you know a lower class part of the society not at all but what I want to say is that each one of these art projects and art forms that I discuss in this book, whether it's graffiti art, performance art, theater, or painting, sculpture, installation, has its own audiences. And it has its roots in the history of them, right? Like a gallery goer is different from someone who sees graffiti art on the street. Someone who goes to theater to be entertained by a play or goes to a music performance to be entertained is different from someone who goes to the Golestan Gallery to see a bunch of abstract paintings. Um, and so the discussion of class is, 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 is obliquely addressed in this book. Uh, but in terms of how I dealt with all of these artists, I have to say, because most of them are prominent artists, whether it's graffiti or, um, or performance or other things, they are top notch in their own fields. They, most of them have gone to college. They're very educated. They're very, very well read. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I would say that they're mostly middle class, if I may say so. Um, in terms of the religious background, Loren, I tried too hard to ask religious questions, right? So I was like, are you influenced by the Tazia? And then they were like, no, 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 we don't do religious stuff. Please leave us alone. You know, we're not interested in that. It's There seems to be certain continuities uh, between these practices and contemporary practices, the practices in the past and the present. I tried to show two examples in this presentation. Aine Kari and also the choreography of people in the city, which comes from some of these processions during Tatsuo and Ashura. Um, and so, yes, religion comes into play in a very indirect way, but I did not encounter anyone who was a hardcore religious person and who wanted to participate in these religious activities. Of course, in my readings, I came across a lot of religious concepts. For example, when I was studying the notion of time in the city for ephemeral art projects that take place in public, I came across a time frame in Tehran that becomes extremely interesting for people. And that's the Az Azan to Azan project uh, that was implemented by Shahdari Tehran during the month of Ramadan when uh, artists and people can actually go out and have a lively nightlife um, and, and the cafes are open during this time, uh, a lot of movie theaters are open during this time. And so, yes, religious ideas were also explored by, like I said, uh, very obliquely. Thank you so much. We have a few more questions. Uh, the next question is, 
how is historicization of any artwork possible without the socio-political considerations, if it is? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that I understand this question. Uh, uh, like, why did I historicize it if there was no historical connection or? We can uh, get further clarification from who sent the question in, hopefully. Uh, and skip to the other question, and uh, the next question in the meantime. Um, if you have any ideas, what do you anticipate that the future of spatial practices will look like? Is it going to continue down this route right. or do you have any, any ideas? Well, thank you for that question. Unfortunately, things have not been very rosy recently since uh, the new government, Raisi's government, uh, came to power. Uh, right from the beginning, uh, a new Barnome, a new program was published by the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance uh, that gave new guidelines to artists and artists were very critical of that from all uh, sections of art, from graphic designers to theater people to painters and so on and so forth. They all wrote criticisms of this new program and I have addressed that in the very last pages of my book. And uh, the Mohsen, my favorite gallery, directed by uh, Eskan Rasulov. Unfortunately, I was notified today that it was closed um, recently. So I, I am not sure uh, what will happen. But what I am hopeful about is that this movement continues no matter what. And Iranians have proven it again and again that they can, uh, that they can walk around these obstacles and overcome. Thank you so much. Uh, another question from the audience. How do you characterize the evolution of themes or mediums? How do I characterize the evolution of themes or mediums? Um, again, I, I'm not sure I fully understand this question. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the other hand, I want to say that this book is not organized based on a specific medium. As you know, a lot of art history books are, for example, organized around painting, sculpture, this and that. Uh, that was not a matter of concern for me. My main concern was how these different artists, no matter their background, engage with the space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, another question from, or a question from Marjan Musevi. Thanks for the fascinating book and talk. I'm curious to know whether this practice of alternative art making in unconventional spaces can be situated within the analytical framework of uh, prefiguration and world making capacity of art in Iran. Uh, yes, I mean, you know, you can take these ideas to many directions and you can elaborate on them uh, further. Uh, and of course, this book uh, was an effort to bring a lot of um, examples and case studies together and theorize it as much as I knew and I could uh, within 450 pages. Uh, but in the future, my hope is that this project uh, can set the tone for, for more future art history books on Iran, which are not just about, you know, documentation of different stylistic features like abstract painting or, or uh, you, know, uh, you know, art with political references uh, to, uh, you know, to women with veil or with the hijab and things like that but that it looks at Iranian art that has the capacity to actually produce theoretical way of thinking about art. So in other words, it's not just a continuation of these Western methods of categorization of, oh, you know, abstract expressionism, this and that, but that it is, it has its own, its own voice and its own identity that is very distinct from the rest of the world. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, on that note, we have our final question, and this is a follow-up from Maryam Ada Amjadi. 
were the artists, particularly the ones who were highly cautious of being represented as political in your book, aware that their art could be interpreted or perceived as political, that their art had the potential to be interpreted as such beyond their intent and control? If yes, how did they make that distinction? Uh, yes, of course, they're fully aware of that. But, uh, you know, I think that sometimes the problem is this. Sometimes we here in the West, we see something from Iran and we immediately make assumptions about it being like a message about you know, the Ayatollahs or a message about, you know, uh, the political situation in Iran. Whereas what they what they were concerned about, these few artists who were questioning me, and I'm, and I'm very glad that they did that. So because, you know, it's not about me challenging them. It's also about them challenging me and questioning me. And this was a pl process of learning for me. They really opened my eyes to the reality on the ground. Uh, when they question me, they wanted to make sure that I take that I that I don't come into their project with certain assumptions, that I capture it in its entirety, that I take into, into consideration what the intentions were and why this art was made. And I appreciated that because I think sometimes, especially because it's very difficult to get a hold of these artists. We see something and we draw our conclusions. And unfortunately, over time, we promote this idea that everybody's political in Iran, that everybody is trying to be, get, to be against the state and things like that. And I think that's, that's not a very good way of approaching what's happening there. Thank you. I think that is a great question to end it on. Uh, Thank you again, Dr. Karimi, for joining us today and, and talking about your book. That is such a valuable contribution to Iranian or scholarship about Iran. Uh, for those in the audience, uh, Iran 14 Project does invite Iranian artists to submit their artworks uh, that are hopefully in line with the vision of the project uh, to reflect on the evolution of ideas and institutions. Uh, we would love to extend our platform to display any of uh, any of that work. Uh, you can contact us at media at iran1400.org if you are interested in doing so, or if you are in the audience and not an artist, but still would like to uh, see if you can work with the project or contribute something, please do reach out to us. We are always eager to uh, work with more Iranian academics, writers, scholars, etc. Uh, all right, on that note, uh, please do check out uh, Dr. Karimi's book, Alternative Iran, Contemporary Art and Critical Spatial Practice. It's published with Stanford University Press. We also next month have an upcoming spotlighting and author event. Uh, that is on the book, Creating Local Democracy in Iran, State Building and the Politics of Decentralization. That's with Kian Tejbach. You can also find us online at iran1400.org, and you can follow us on social media at Iran1400 Project. If you find today's event interesting, we have relevant articles on our websites, uh, websites such as Repurposing the Past in Iranian Modern Art, which is an article on our website that you can find. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, please do enjoy the rest of your day and check out the project. Thank you, Dr. Kramer.